With that, now without further ado, I am proud to introduce our speaker, Mary Erlane. Mary Erlane is to help companies and individuals meet their goals through uncovering talents and potential. Mary Erlane is, is a published author and speaker with her most recent books in, um, excuse me, that address the five generations in the workplace. Diversity issues are a root cause of many of the problems of business today that affect growth, productivity, and profitability. She has a mission to strengthen an organization's core foundation to be competitive in the marketplace. She also has a support system of resources and knowledge of marketplace trends within various industries. Welcome, Mary Erlane. And Leslie, could you mute everyone, please? Yes. All right, hi everyone. I think we're all good. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We're gonna um, have this just be a little different. There'll be um, a few breaks where we can ask questions as opposed to keeping them all up at the end. Um, I will let you know when we can go ahead and unmute or you can chat your questions in. And then we also have some polling questions. So it is a pleasure um, to be here and um, Let's just jump right in. So I'm gonna go through the generations um, first and uh, we'll get those defined. Uh, I love to use the images of how people received information during our five generations. I hear a lot of talk about four generations, but technically there are five. We may have a blink of an eye of six, but there are definitely um, five going on. Um, right now. Uh, our traditionalists, and this is an image of a um, probably a mid-50s uh, Chevy um, and, and their radio. And when we look at our traditionalists, this is how they received information is everyone gathered around the radio. Um, families, you know, and, and um, even um, <clears throat> young boomers or sorry, older boomers would gather around and listen to information on, on the radio. So um, when we look at this particular generation, there are less than 5% when you're looking at their ages, um, but there is still quite a few people. And the, the challenge I saw during the pandemic was that folks in this generation really had to balance their health risks and their need to work because there are some traditionalists that are outliving their retirement, perhaps by um, their poor planning or just the nature of their retirement um, with medical bills or just their ability to save at all. Um, but this particular generation uh, set the foundation um, in, in how they viewed work with the depression and that image that you see on the screen is actually the brands of the soup line in, in the depression. Um, not surprising that the depression created a place of um, the viewpoint of work being conservative, fiscally prudent, loyal to employers. Um, now, if, if people on this um, call have um, grandparents or, or parents, I know these were my folks and that absolutely formed them. They never knew when the next shoe was going to fall. And this particular uh, group also want to stay in the workplace and health advances have surely given them the ability to work much longer than generations previous to them. Um, they have the desire, but many still do need to work. So this is a generation that still has a um, large group of people in it. And again, from a communication perspective, this is how people received information is through the channels of a TV set. And in this case, during their formative years, it was TV sets that oftentimes look like this. Seriously, this is the uh, almost looked identical to the TV set I grew up with. Um, when we look at the generation, it's rather a large um, component. We are made up of baby boomers. World War II ended. 
um, people bought the um, or built the home and, and started families. Our older group uh, is a group of people that it's easy to find. And if anybody is in this age group, you could chat in the answer to this question, where were you when JFK, John F. Kennedy was killed? Because in a blink of an eye, they know and can put themselves right back into what typically could have been um, that, that uh, desk chair in so-and-so's class in whatever school. Um, this particular generation uh, was wrought with losing three significant leaders, John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr. There are many younger generational people that don't know those acronyms the way um, we do. Um, we had some serious uh, time, turbulent times on our soil as well as in our world. You know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had the Vietnam War, um, we had civil rights, anti-war protests. You know, this, this particular time of the formative years of our older boomers was wrought with a lot of unrest in um, the U.S. And, and like I said, um, the world. This particular group has a, and I'm, I'm not using a political term, but has a more liberal and open-minded um, way of thinking. Um, you know, I, I can remember doing this presentation to Meeting Planners International, um, and, you know, somebody in the room said flower power, and she was clearly from this particular group of, of individuals. Um, this particular sect of the uh, baby boomers are retiring at, at very um, large numbers. And I'll, I'll get into the, the, uh, the effect on the, in the workplace when I, after I cover our second group. And I will ask people, I mean, I'm not monitoring the chat, but I will ask people to chat in their guess of who that is, um, that image is. As many people um, don't know, and I will give it away, but this happens to be my particular generation of people. And, and these are things that uh, events that happened in my life that I distinctly um, remember. You know, on that TV set on the in the beginning is, is actually where I would um, watch as well as understand um, Watergate and the Nixon resignation. Um, I was old enough to understand what was happening but not necessarily old enough to understand the total impact. Um, I can surely remember um, all the shortages. Um, I can remember at a very young age, we bought a home and um, I can remember that the interest rate was, um, I, we were doing happy dance at 12 and a half because interest rates were in the 16s. And I know that kind of blows people's mind, but wow. we were actually happy with 12 and a half. <laughs> um, yeah. We had a very um, different kind of turbulence going on. And in this case, it had much more to do with the political unrest. We had you know, one side of the party, um, such as President Nixon um, resigning and Watergate. And then we had another um, party with President Carter with out the roof um, inflationary times. And, and so we became a little more distrusting a government with some of the events that were going on in the Cold War. Did anybody guess Bob Geldof? We had a brand new disease. I have a healthcare background. Um, we had a brand new disease arrive and that was AIDS. And there was a whole lot of unrest around that. So the times were different, but yet we form one large generation called baby boomers. And our baby boomers right now are planning to work a lot longer than previous generations. Um, many don't have a backup plan for retirement. Um, we have gone through our fair share of um, um, financial um, hits, you know, with uh, various recessions. Um, we've also, you know, the rising cost of education, putting kids through school, poor planning. But the one thing the baby boomers have done, and they had to, is they had to quickly adapt 
to the pandemic demands. This is a generation who likes to do things knee to knee, face to face, you know, across the small table at Starbucks. We've had to climb on to this kind of a platform and continue to do business, whatever that means, whether that's business development or meetings or running an organization. Um, and in, in short order, and I, I will say many kicking and screaming, but the baby boomer population has um, adapted. Our Gen Xers, and if you have the screen large enough, please note um, uh, right here, I think I can point, isn't that a price tag? Um, I owned a 386 computer and um, I know I didn't pay that for it. Um, the screen was probably smaller than most um, iPads and, and weighed about a hundred times more. Um, you could do, you know, go get yourself a cup of tea and maybe the internet screen would paint in on the dial up, um, you know, by the time you got there. But this was the changing time. Our Gen Xers were the first ones that got into the world of um, technology and technology began to show up in places it had not in the past. Because of the baby boomers in the tail end um, with inflation and, and the rising cost of raising a family, this particular generation um, were the first larger number of people that had both parents working. Women had, typically it was the women that were at home, women were accepted in the workplace. The baby boomer population had more educated women to, be, to, to take a position. Many had to go to work. And that left this generation at home at a younger age than, than prior generations. Um, meaning, it, it absolutely fed into the independence because as children um, and teenagers, they were left to be to need to take care of their own needs while mom and dad were both at work. So there is a certain self-sufficiency and their ability to be able to be independent. And this is where technology actually fed and continues to feed, making life faster, better, easier, and smarter. Now, this is the generation, one of the two, that are in that sandwich phase of life. And let me define that. The sandwich phase of life is that they still have children to care for, but now they have aged parents too. Now, some of the boomers um, are blessed to still have parents, but a large portion of the Xers are in that place where they, they are caught in, in two roles, yet still need to have a career. This pandemic has also caused them to be kind of at that mid to maybe not sunset, but midpoint of a career where they're contemplating, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? So in the great resignation, many different factors are feeding that. Um, they're ripe. Um, for philanthropy, and the right to start their business in the entrepreneur's world. Let's remember these, these Gen Xers have faced the Y2K tech bubble. They faced 9-11, 2008 recession, and now a pandemic. This particular generation has been knocked around, you know, at least four different times. So hitting the pause button and saying, what do I want to do with the rest of my life is not surprising. And then our Gen Ys are our millennials. Um, I use pagers um, because this is the first, we'll call it instant messaging that we had around. Now, people probably don't remember pagers, but if you remember these little pagers, this was predominantly for the healthcare industry and attorneys a lot. But this little area right here had the ability to put in the shortest of messages, typically a phone number. You still needed to go to one of these. <laughs> My son gave me this as a gift, and I always keep it handy for this presentation. But nonetheless, 
it was a way to get people when they weren't necessarily next to the phone or reachable. This generation um, is getting, I, I, will not do, I, mean, I will not do millennial bashing. I think there are way too many speakers out there slapping this generation around and, oh yeah, that's right. I gave birth to two of them. I raised two of these folks. And um, I realized the style in which I raised, um, and that's not a global statement, the bullet point number one, but the trend was a different style of raising children. Because of the nature of being connected and you know, our earliest um, internet connections began to improve, um, no longer was our world defined by zip codes. You know, we were, I had a pen pal as a baby boomer in, in Chile. Um, and in this case, they can be connected to anyone, anytime, anywhere. Uh, this particular generation um, was also very open-minded. Our borders began to bring in a rich, diverse cultures into our country. So our classrooms and the places they were educated um, began to bring in um, a whole different um, groups of, of individuals and they embraced that. And these guys require work-life balance. These guys have seen 9-11, 2008 and, nine, um, and now, um, but they've also seen in the recession, my kids were old enough to remember when my husband and my father were both laid off. And so when we talk about loyalty to companies, they've had that direct impact to their families. Um, they also need companies to have more of a cause nature. They're very cause driven. They're also entering those sandwich years as well, where they are have families, but then their parents are beginning to age. Um, now, we're starting to see millennials gravitate towards more stability in jobs because the jobs are offering the very thing they wanted. Because of the pandemic, there is that flexibility um, that they've always desired and thrived in. And then this generation kind of gets um, um, included into the millennials when they're a very different generation. I have to point out that this is my very own. <laughs> um, and he is the perfect example of why when I get to don't stereotype. Um, but these, the world moves very, very quickly for our, our Gen Zs. They process at lightning speed. They've always had technology in their hand to be able to support that. Um, social media has driven and redefined um, what privacy means. They're far more open books. If you want to make them um, read a white paper, probably better to have them listen to a podcast because everything in their life has been short spurts. When you're looking at social media and text messaging and so on, um, you know, you even just look at videos, keep getting shorter and shorter. And they have been raised by groups of people, not just parents, but even the, the um, education system supports this, where there is a constant ability to be connected. Um, the, the pandemic um, at the earliest has happened for them at the earliest parts of them entering the workplace. And this concept of online, they may have been doing for a while since we have had college online for many, many years. So face-to-face -face sometimes can be a challenge, but we can learn everything. So now we arrive to that one midpoint and I'm going to open the polls and I want you, I didn't say by birth, what do you identify with, not necessarily the one you were born in, but the one that you function in? Because we can evolve. So I'm going to open the poll right now. And uh, is it open? Yes. Uh, 
Um, I didn't see it yet. Mary. Oh, relaunch poll. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Okay, we had our first technology glitch. Questions, Leslie? No questions have come in yet. Um, some or unmute or some comments. Interesting comments in the chat, and then I will. Um, everyone is uh, um, able to unmute themselves. So if they do want to uh, comment or chat, um, either way. Hey Mary, uh, culture. How does culture fit in? with the different generations have you have you looked at that and studied it yes studied it? and and we will get to that jim excellent <laughs> i will talk about culture all right i'll hold on yeah that, that's a great question because that's absolutely um i will comment to the point that um every company's culture has been torn apart period there's you may get the folks that look like this or you or me or, or Leslie back, but they're changed. There, there's an evolution. And so we will um, talk a bit more about that and um, what is it that you can do? Anyone else? We do have a question. Yes, which, ma'am. Which generations do you see having the hardest time collaborating? Mm. I think in the past, it might have been um, baby boomer and millennial um, in that there's a lot of parent child stuff that goes on in that. The awkwardness can happen when the, the millennial or any younger person is in a role leading any older person and the whole dynamic um, we, we tend to bring that can bring that dynamic in and um, we begin to talk to each other in a parent, child, child, parent situation, as opposed to two peers. I had this where I had two project managers. Um, I, I did a presentation um, and for the life of me, I can't think of the name of the company, but the older project manager who was a peer with another project manager who was younger, it was like, well, why can't she just come to my office with all kind of tone and attitude? And I'm like, let me help me understand your peers. I said, it wasn't a boss, you know, employee situation. And I said, all right, do you have situations that are very urgent? And do you have situations that perhaps you're acting proactively? And she said, yes. And I said, well, the time it takes to run to it's a very huge company to your office is time lost would that be possible to maybe discuss on the phone or in your inter chat features or whatnot but things that you're proactive about maybe the two of you could get together and she sat in that moment feeling very convicted and realizing that the project manager who was younger and trying to use technology and use the systems that the company provided was bringing efficiency to problem solving. So, you know, you can get those kind of dynamics. Um, emotional intelligence is another area. And, and if you don't have emotional intelligence at um, high emotional intelligence happening in any conversation, it doesn't even really matter what the age is, but that can, that can really send conversations and situations off the rails. Um, so there is that component as well. Anything else? Yes. Another question. Um, millennials are seen as the generation who are most optimistic for the future. Do you think that young people were very optimistic in the early sixties with president Kennedy and advances in medicine and civil rights? I think there were leaders that were encouraging and if, and, and I don't remember I'm not that old to remember the, the, the civil rights, but I do remember um, the voices were, um, were very loud. In this case, what has lent itself to um, the current situation is the ease in communication. You know, Simon Sinek shares that 250,000 people showed up to Martin Luther King for the, they called it the Million Man March. 
And he said, there was no internet. There was no, you know, social media. There was no, it was true word of mouth and optimism that, that created that, that those people to join. Today, it actually supports, technology can support hearing voices louder because it can multiply and go viral in the blink of an eye. So different times, but um, yes, I would say optimism, but I think word of mouth was even stronger um, back in the, in the 60s and 70s. Shall I continue? The polling is, I'm going to end the poll. Um, so we can continue forward. And then I will share results. Everyone can see that? I can see it. Okay. So we have predominantly the, the um, sandwich generation right now, our, our Gen Xs. All right, let's move on. Now, um, our generations have different values, um, ideas, ways of getting things done and ways of communicating. Now, when I talk of values, values are those, those words that you're going to hear like integrity, honesty, um, hard work, commitment. Those, what a value is to you is that if I be, for me, if you are dishonest with me, it's almost like you taking the heel of your shoe and stepping on my big toe and then putting weight on it. It's going to cause me to react and push you away. Our core values um, are, we define those individually. Now, generations may have generational meanings of values, but let me challenge you. Many of you have siblings and do each one of you have exactly the same values? Of course not, but you were raised in the same house during similar times, unless there's very wide age gaps. Um, there still is an individuality amongst our generation. So you may land in a generation by birth. You may identify with a generation from that polling question, but don't lose track of the fact that you are an individual. And the way you define your values is very individual. The way you think an idea, have ideas. Um, it's a, in a brainstorming session and that comes up and you're brainstorming a solution or a project or an idea or um, a new product. Not everybody around the table comes up with the same idea. Again, there's an individuality to this. And the ways of getting things done, and I swear I'm going to do this when we can get back live in large numbers, is if I gave everybody the same bag of Lego trucks and with the instructions and, and said, okay, here you have to build this, this little Lego truck, and I just sat and watched, it would be, I would be hard pressed to find people doing it the exact same way. We all have our own unique ways of getting things done. There are some that need to do things very linear. There are some that can have plates spinning all along the way and they just kind of manage it along. There are some that can jump around. Point is, we're all very unique. There are some of us that use pen to paper. There are some that will pick up a piece of technology. And then different ways of communicating. And, and I will get into those. Um, I'll get into communication in a little bit. The end of the day, we have two choices. We can look at things as different, therefore wrong. So I see somebody with a day planner and, and I go, my goodness, why are you using a day planner when you could, you know, use this? Um, as opposed to not wrong, just different. Not wrong, just different has me asking the question, how is using an actual paper day planner helpful and seeking to understand? So a great, a little story. And, and I saw a group of, um, it was a bachelorette party. And I was out um, a few years back. I was out with a friend of mine over dinner. 
and this bachelorette party came in and and sat down um it was like a two level restaurant so they sat right below us and i found myself watching this bachelorette party and and the phones were and they're taking pictures and and they, their thumbs were just in constant motion and they're talking and it was a flurry of activity and the old judgmental baby boomer in the moment went why aren't they paying attention to each other? Get off your phones. But then the business coach and consultant kicked in and said, how fascinating. Because what about the person in the wedding party that didn't get a babysitter and is, you know, at home with the kids? Or what about the overseas friend that they went to school with? And now she or he gets to, to pop in. And I went, that is amazing. Instead of just those dozen ladies that were around the table, there could have been hundreds, thousands of people that got to share in that. Not wrong, just different. And so I sat and I held that moment and I hold it today as a great depiction of how shut off and judgmental we, we shut the door on our ability to communicate and work together if we different, therefore wrong. You're not doing it like me, as opposed to not wrong, just different. Uh, when I look at this, I said avoid stereotyping. Remember the picture of my um, Gen Z son? Uh, my Gen Z son um, is, uh, he is summa cum laude and also um, did uh, time at Oxford um, university in England. He's a smart guy, but his favorite way of functioning is this. He is Mr. Post-it note. He has the, the post-it note jungle around his computer. And I go, honey, they have this thing called one note Trello, you know, no, this is fine. He loves paper and pencil. And I'm like, who are you? <laughs> You're in your thirties. You should be like telling me all the apps. Don't stereotype. Don't see somebody who may look like a, a baby boomer and think, yeah, you know what? I'm going to give Mary a call. Please don't call me. Text me. Instant message me. You know, um, don't catch me on social media. I'm, I'm not, we all have that ability to evolve. You know, our traditionalists can be rather tech savvy because they couldn't see, even the queen for heaven's sake is, is on Zoom um, because she couldn't see her, her grandkids and her great grandkids. Be careful, don't just see a picture and the, it goes both ways. I kept trying to call my son on his cell phone and he's like, Ma, call me on my landline. I shut my phone off. And he gives me a headache. He is this old soul stuck inside somebody 30, but there are so many of them out there. And then let's talk about communication. Um, how we communicate just as an individual, there are so, so, so many factors that go into it beyond our age. Now, our, our age definitely how comfortable we are in the technology platform is absolutely true. But we've got to take our education levels. We have to look at our personalities, introverted, extroverted, competitive, more team-driven, cooperative. I do a host of um, digital um, assessments that you know, bring out really the personality dimensions and all of those show up in our communication. Our experience. Do we have a taskmaster boss who is, who in essence has kind of shriveled our communication and we're a little less inclined? Or if we had that open forum where we can share? And then even something as simple as our family dynamics, when it's been perhaps a very long time since we lived at that home address, you know, where we grew up. But our family dynamics do still play a little bit of a role in it that firstborn, that middle child, even who our parents were. And then 
one more thing that's not on there is our emotional intelligence shows up. Our own self-awareness, regulation, and our own internal motivation married up with our ability to be empathic and, and married up against social skills. So communication, I'm a business coaching consultant. That's all I, I do is, is talk around communication. Now, I promised I would get to culture. There it is. When we talk about culture, it's how we do things. It's formed over time and it's driven by people. That's culture. So there are, according to Harvard Business Review, there is eight different cultures. And as far as how, um, how the, the generations, again, that's a bit more individualistic because I have done culture surveys and do them inside of organizations. And you could have a need, and this is something companies or teams can do, I've done this with teams, is if you have a leader who has more of an um, order-based culture, you know, structure, rule following, that may not work so much with the younger generation. That's that that may be more driven. You'll you'll see a bit more of order driven in like our armed forces. Um, but there's the Google culture, which young people, as well as older people, but young people definitely thrived in where it was employee engagement. There was an element of fun. Um, there was um, um, high morale. Morale was, was the, the goal where in a, um, an order-based culture, it's, it's more outcomes, you know, in the purpose-based culture, you'll find those in nonprofits. It's a greater good or a caring based culture. You'll find those in nonprofits that oftentimes deal with children or a particular illness. Um, so there are eight different, you can go out and see the, the wonderful article, it's available, and there's definitely many blogs um, from that one. But culture has been torn apart, like I, I said to, to Jim earlier, it's time to rebuild, it will rebuild itself. And you have the power to even modify the culture within a team. There are great culture quizzes out there, and it might be a great exercise to do with a, a team. You know, when we look at um, strategy, the strategy that you had in February of 2020 went out the window in March of 2020. Um, and the day of the shutdown was my husband's and my 40th wedding anniversary. So I'll kind of remember that day. Uh, so, but strategy, how we do strategy used to be a long six month process again, short spurts for younger generations. Somebody like Lencioni created a, um, a strategic planning model that's six questions. So what will work for you? Um, I'm not gonna, technology has been covered in this, this conference and I, I don't wanna step on the expert's toes, but um, how, how can technology truly foster? Because what one company is doing may not suit another. What one team may be doing may not suit another. And how can you lean in to use technology to augment um, productivity and, and truly um, focus on organizational success? Security. Uh, security is a word that means many things to many people. Like I said, the folks that came back to work may look like this, but they have been affected. And the concept of security um, is as unique as, as our thumbprints. Um, and it might be something to get a conversation going around. And what is it that, that folks truly need? You may not be able to meet them at every single one of their points. But here's one factor that's not being spoken about in the, the great resignation. And that is a lot of people are leaving because they don't feel heard. So if you can create a feedback loop on any one of these topics on this page, you can take one step in being able to retain talent. 
and processes and procedures and staff and client management. Um, Long-winded two, three-hour Zoom session meetings are painful. How is it that you can employ huddles, have different kinds of meetings like a feedback meeting, um, a uh, performance meeting, a brainstorming meeting, an accountability meeting? How can you get on and get off more quickly? Uh, because Zoom fatigue eventually does affect accountability. Um, so therein lies, there's no one size fits all. That's what I do is help build these. But we're going to get to our next polling question. Let me see if I know how I can do this. Um, polling question. Oh, isn't that great? That one's not loaded. All right, we'll load one. <laughs> Sorry about um, that. I maybe I thought. No, that's um, okay. No okay. worries. <laughs> so I we'll watch this one. This Why not? Okay. Which type of recognition motivates you the most? This will be interesting because we just got done talking about differences. So questions. So a question that came in a little bit uh, as part of the last um, session or. Um, unmuting, but I think it's still relevant here. Since culture is created and sustained through conversation, do you think culture is more fluid with Gen Z because of their communication style and relatively easier time with rapid change? Okay, I am sorry. I had a drag racer fly by. So can you repeat that question? I am so sorry. It was like the best part of the question I missed. <laughs> no problem. Um, do you think culture is more fluid with Gen Z because of their communication style and relatively easier time with rapid change? Fluid. Culture is in an organization. So it may be fluid if it's an organization that is made up of Gen Zs. But a culture is truly from the owner down the org chart in an organization. So, so at the end of the day, like I said, it's how we do things. It's, it's an essence, um, you know, when you think of the culture, you think of Google. Google built what seemingly was a fluid culture because it was, it was driven um, by enjoyment it still was an enjoyment culture. Things just began to, to move. It did not go from an enjoyment culture to a caring culture, to a purpose-driven culture, to um, an authoritative culture. So it felt fluid, but it was defined. So, so there's a, and, and I, can, I can send that to you, Leslie, there is a wonderful image that plots out the eight different types of, of culture. I can snatch it off of HBR's thing so that maybe that can be thrown into the presentation at the end and we can share that. So people have an image of really how cultures are defined. Other questions, very interesting results. Go ahead. Nothing else in chat right now. So I will see if well, folks want to unmute. All right. So that's right. I'm the only one that gets to see the poll results. <laughs> it's like you guys were seeing them live. Um, look at this. It is split. It is fairly evenly split between the, um, the top three, the one, three, and five. Um, Interesting, there is a good number of people that are money motivated. Um, time off, um, but title and recognition, compensation and flexibility. But at the end of the day, flexibility does come into second. And when we're looking, if I look back, um, we are a three generation um, attendees in this um, with, I'm trying to remember the other results. So th those were, these do line up. It would be interesting if we had some Gen Zs and, and how this, this might um, shift the, uh, the perception. I'm not, I'm not terribly surprised by these results um, at all. 
um, the flexibility thing, if I guess I wish I could poll again, but I wonder how many people are surprised by this not being farther over here with the pandemic. I'm slightly surprised this is not higher. Is that, and had we taken this poll, what might it have looked like pre-pandemic? What, how would this have skewed numbers? How are you doing, pal? Interesting. Is there any comments yeah. in chat yeah, coming like in this, on that? Yeah, a lot Mary. of stuff going on. You were trying to make it all work and then. Yeah. Oh. So it, it might be interesting to ponder that as a group to say we're answering relative. And, and I remember Dr. Proctor earlier saying we forget. <laughs> And, and those, her, her words are, are in my brain right now um, because we've gotten flexibility, but would that have been a greater desire prior to pandemic? Cool. So there, there are two quick questions. Um, one is how are compensation and money different? Um, all right. So compensation and money. Um, money might be... Um, salary compensation, I might look at as benefits. The, the things that the creative golden handcuffs that um, companies, and that very good question because that could have skewed things too. So money I see is just pure salary. You make X number of thousands of dollars a year. Compensation comes in the world of PDOs, paid days off, um, other, um, other types of benefits, 401ks, things that are per se adding to your W-2 at the end of the year, but do add compensation in essence to your, um, your role. In one more question, did you say? Yes. Um, and then we'll, we'll save one, I think, towards the end. Um, given the communication preferences of different generations, how do we get to common ground and effectively communicate between and across the generations? Oh, I love people that hold tight. <laughs> um, we're going to get to the solutions right now. <laughs> so... Thank you for that, that it was like a segue. It was like, it was like a, an introduction. Um, build bridges. So things that we need to do and, and um, clearly communicate the, the changes that are going on in the workplace. There are some people that can kind of roll with the punches as things change. And then there are those people that, you know, um, there are some people that just rolled right into March of 2020 and into April and, and May and just slid right in um, because change is per se um, not as threatening. And then there are those people that, that need that time and space. It's just how we're wired person in our personalities. So you know what? It's always better to give time and clearly communicate the changes and give people time to be able to adapt. You know, if I had a moment, I would share the I had some change management work and, and the graph of how people come through the, the concept of change. There are people that can just slide right through it. And then there are several places that people can stall. So transparent and frequent communication can alleviate anxiety about getting people to focus on their, their work. Um, you know, we need to um, treat people as individuals. So again, just because somebody might look a certain age or fit a certain generation, um, again, be careful stereotyping because how people, especially now, how people have adapted have, have been remarkable in, in many instances. I said, I am, I am not a prophet, but in my book, I literally, literally said in 2020, business is going to look very different. Never in my wildest dreams did I think it was going to happen in a blink of an eye, or at least that felt that way. But that I was encouraging people back in 13 and 14 to begin this, this progression of, of changing the way we did business. Many companies got it like an icy bucket of cold water. So offering those flexible work arrangements um, that can support work-life balance, but yet at the same time, um, rebuilding a culture 
you know, to, to be able to embrace that. Um, and then, you know, approaching people with humility and the curiosity, that's the not wrong, just different. Show me, how does it help you? Be inquisitive and interested and maybe, just maybe, you know, um, I could possibly take something that someone else is doing and apply it to myself and make myself better. You know, other ways are offering um, the health and, and um, welfare type benefits that promote physical, what I mean is the uh, personal welfare benefits that actually promote the, um, the health and well-being of people. Um, and, and there are many, many creative things that you can do that don't necessarily have to be on the company's dime, but there are, you know, I know insurance companies have their, um, their, their promoting um, proactive health care, um, and there are a number of programs. Um, there are a number, back to that compensation, there's a number of, of things companies can do, um, even if it's just teaching about retirement being better prepared. Um, you know, th there's a huge time horizon for our Gen Zs and, and a shorter one for our millennials to not make the mistakes of, of what the baby boomers and our traditionalists have made. So that's another way to invest. So it isn't always with the almighty dollar. It can just be investing. Offering that ability for training to be in different media formats. There was a teacher that said, why are people not, why are young people not at this live workshop? This was years ago. I said, because it's a live workshop. <laughs> it's not a podcast. It's not a video online. It's just not their particular preferred style of learning. So offering that ability to, to have um, training and professional development um, in different media formats. Uh, and then other solutions is, it's a great exercise. And I love doing this is the value exercise. You know, I've done this and yes, the company has values and the, and they can't be Enron values. Go, go up and look and up Enron values. And they did not live up to their values, but I'm talking about the company may have a list of values but I've done this within teams where we determine what are the greatest common core values in a team. Age and generation tend to just kind of melt. And what we do is we become a common group of people. And once those are declared and they become our operating um, values, it's, it's a great place to be able to, to um, build teams. Uh, additionally, the moment you hear they or them coming out of your mouth, you've just created divisiveness. It's a we. If each one of you have the same logo on your paycheck or you're listed on the same website, you're a we. There is no they. Because approaching leadership and relationships and management from a we perspective, yes, the ultimate decision does rest on somebody. But I even heard Dr. Proctor, I'm interested in what other people said. And she ran Harper College pretty tough times um, and some, some really crazy, crazy times. So if you catch, hopefully I've, I've planted a seed. So the next time you hear they come out of your mouth or them come out of your mouth, hopefully it will kind of trigger to go, wait, we, I've just removed myself from the team by excluding whoever it is you're referring to. And, you know, if you want to operate back when we were, it's a different, therefore wrong. Not that there aren't some seeds of wisdom to say back when, so that you can maybe bring it forward, as opposed to taking your company all the way back to 2019. 2019 was a great year, but there's so many opportunities in 20 and 21 and going forward. Um, we can use 2019 and before kind of like our corded phones 
but in reality, the corded phone exists in that. Do we really want to go back to using the corded phone or do we maybe want to make this better? Which is the not wrong, just different approach. So Mary, just doing a quick time check. We have oh, four minutes. Well, I have two slides. Okay. And well, and I'll run through the, the last few, but the work ethic, it's, we personalize this and we make it like, if we look in Webster's dictionary or that our definition of work ethic is work ethic. No, it's just the value of work to an individual. Be careful of over-personalizing it and using it a bar to judge other people because baby boomers work to live historically. And other generations, Gen Xers and beyond, no, I'm sorry, live, I said that wrong, live to work. Work was their life. The, the other generations that are beyond that work to live, meaning work supports a lifestyle. Very, very different. And this is where you can really have a rub. Just remember, what's the value of work to you may not be somebody else. Um, and then, uh, uh, okay, um, yes, there we go, launch it. <laughs> All right, your motivation to succeed. Be honest, what is your motivation? Is it the organization, your individual goals? What is it you have an eye on? Um, let me just, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with a question. Let me, um, because you've got the poll up. No, I can't do it. So our next generation, okay, are we almost all in? Because I want to be careful on time. Vote, vote, vote. Do I have a quick question I can answer? Um, how does one assess culture of a company before they join a company? The questions you ask at the interview when they say, and what questions do we have of you? Insert name here. Go to that, the, get that. Um, if, if you really are a learning-based company, confirm that is a learning opportunity for you. Or if you need that structure in that order, Learn to ask the behavioral questions. And here's my favorite question if you're interviewing. Leslie, how long have you been with the company? Leslie's been here for a dozen years. What keeps you staying here, Leslie? What keeps you coming back to work? Best, I interview, I do hiring for companies, bar none, best question ever. Because it's one that Leslie will never be used to hearing. We can ask questions, oh, share results. And then I think I can switch, no, I can't. Interesting, it's pretty split. Um, okay, let me end that. And then let me just quickly share who our next generation is. And it's, so what do we call this generation? That's my grandson when he was three at the um, Dandelion Fountain in Naperville, Illinois. These guys are in an absolute metamorphosis of 2020. It, these, these are not surprises, but, and that is Noah as well. And, um, but this is this group of generation. And when I said, in 2019, I never dreamed that this is a, a generation in evolution because I believe these bullet points will evolve as this generation gets a little older. And then we will just rest um, here. And then um, questions. Oh, we, do we have any? I think we're at time. Sorry. We do. Yeah, we're at time. We have two questions. Oh, um, sure. So Quickly. Okay, so um, actually we need to wrap up, unfortunately. Um, so Mary, I don't know, would you recommend um, those two folks with questions to please reach out to you? I think your contact here. information is on here. Okay, um, and then what I'd like to do is um, I want to share my screen for a moment. Oh, let me stop share, sorry, sorry. Okay, no worries. Okay, and...
Um, so one quick thing, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, um, our talented, insightful presenter, Mary Erlane. As a token of appreciation, the chapter would like to present the certificate to you, and it will be emailed after the event. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for your presentation. It was very insightful. Thank we you. learned a lot about um, what makes each generation unique how the pandemic has influenced the generations and the ways to capitalize on the differences to empower a workforce. Um, I have just a couple of things. I'm going to go ahead and stop the, or um, stop the recording now as the rest